Okay, so we're going to look at cumulative frequency and box plots. And what we've got to remember is cumulative frequency uh, sometimes is given. It'll uh, be obvious uh, if the heading in this column is cumulative frequency. Or sometimes uh, they give you the frequencies and expect you to fill in this uh, column. So let's go for what's going on. So in the 50 to 55 group, there's 12. Well, that's what was in the original table. And to get the next cumulative frequencies, we're literally going to be adding the frequencies as we go down. The column. So we've got 12 plus 21, so 33, and then we've got 33 plus 36, so 69, and then we've got 69 plus 23, uh, 92, and then we've got uh, add another 8, so 100. And again, we should be thinking about uh, is there anything we can do to check the answer? Well, what we notice quite often in exam questions is they told us there was 100 batteries and our cumulative frequency will become 100. We then have to plot um, this cubic frequency graph. Now, what we have to remember about plotting cubic frequency graphs is that it's always the end of the intervals that they give you. So we've got to remember to plot the end of the interval. So that's important when you're doing cubic frequency graphs. Uh, so. Basically, uh, standard plotting. So, our first one ended in 55, plot to 12, so 55 up to 12. And we've done the usual, we've checked the scale of the graph, and we can see that to go from 0 to 20, there were 10 little squares, so each little square was from F2, so 6 little squares up gives us 12. And our next one was 60 and 33, so 60 to 33, so 20, 30, 32, 33. And then it was 65 to 69, so 65 up to 69, and 70 to 92, and 75 to 100. And again, one of the things we've got to realise about cumulative frequency graphs is that if you've drawn a cumulative frequency graph always, cumulative means uh, get bigger and bigger, so the graph should always be increasing, 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 and will classically give this uh, kind of O-GIF shape, an elongated S shape. Um, so let's uh, try and get that. Now, to get the end point down the uh, bottom of the graph, uh, we look at the smallest uh, possible value in the uh, table, and 50 was the smallest possible value for the time. So we'll start the graph off at uh, 50, 0. And you try and draw the smoothest curve you possibly can through all the points. So it's a freehand, smooth curve. Do not take your pen off the or pencil off the graph, and you draw the smoothest curve possible through them. So that's the cumulative frequency graph drawn. Question uh, goes on to say that you've got to use your graph to estimate the median time. So what we've got to realise with the cumulative frequency graph is that it's allowing you to look at what happens across the whole range of the battery times in this example. And we've got 100 batteries. The median is going to be the middle one. Now, normally we would add 1 to the 100 and halve it to find the exact middle item. But on a cumulative frequency graph, you can estimate by just doing a straight 50% halfway point. So at 50, which is the halfway point for the median, then the whole purpose is we're going to use the graph. So we come across to the graph and we read off the value as accurately as we can. So again about reading scales, um, we've got 10 little squares for 5 along the bottom, so each little square is going to be worth a half, so we've got 60, 60 half, 61, 61 and a half, 62, so 62. And if we want to, so the median number is halfway, but the cumulative frequency scale to the top of the graph. Just be careful with this because sometimes the example are a little bit clever. They'll get you to draw a cumulative frequency graph and the graph scale might go to 200, but the cumulative frequency graph itself stops at 160. So it's always halving the total cumulative frequency, not the halving the scale of the graph they actually give you. So just got to be careful of that one. Um, the question then, uh, so that was 62. The question then says, work out an estimate of the interquartile range. 
Well, like all formulas, we really ought to write them down to remember what's going on. So the interquartile range is the upper quartile value minus the lower quartile value. And the word quartile is doing what it says. It kind of implies it's a quarter of the ways and three quarters of the ways. So the lower quartile value is a quarter of the way of the cumulative shrinks and the total cumulative shrinks. And the upper quartile is three quarters of the way. So a measure of 25% of the way in your data and 75% of the way in your data. So again, we go back to the graph. And halfway was 50 in this particular instance. So a quarter of the, um, the whole thing will be half of that. So that's going to be 25. So... 22, 24, 25. So again, we come across to our graph, being careful on the accuracy, and then we read off the value. So 55, 57 and a half, 58, 58 and a half. So 58.5 for the upper quartile value, and the upper quartile value is going to be three quarters of the way up. So what we tend to do is, that was 25, we had the uh, halfway value 50, so 75. So 70, 72, 74, 75. So again, we come across to the graph line we drew. And let's come down as carefully as we can. And we read our value, so 65, 65 and a half, 66. So it's just before 66, but we're estimating. So 66 will do. And the interquartile value is going to be the 66 minus the 58 and a half we found for each of the two values. So the difference between those is 7.5. So the answer here, 7.5 hours. Um, we need to remember things like the interquartile range is a measure of the spread of the middle 50% of your data. So in other words, it uh, kind of ignores extreme values. So it's a useful measure to take account of what happens within the middle. And the lower quartile value we need to remember is 25% of the way along your data. So it tells you that 25% of your data is lower than that and 75% of your data is higher than that. And the upper quartile value is about 75% of the way in your data. So again, the upper quartile value tells you that 75% of the data is below that and 25% of the data is above that. So those are the kind of measures that uh, you might have to interpret with the interquartile range, upper quartile values and lower quartile values. It then goes on to talk about uh, using your graph to estimate what percentage of the batteries lasted more than 68 hours. So if you go back to the graph, and we've got to look at uh, what happens at 68 hours. So 67 and a half, so 68 again, reading the graph carefully. So that's 68 hours. And we're then going to basically use the graph in reverse. We're going to go up to our graph and we're estimating how many batteries lasted well, the question says it wants to know the, battery, uh, the batteries that lasted more than 68 hours. So we're going to find that this value here is 80, 82, 84, 85. So what that tells me is that 85 batteries lasted less than 68 hours. The question says more, so it's telling me that 15 batteries lasted more. So we'll go back to the question and it says use your graph to estimate what percentage of the batteries lasted uh, more than 68 hours so 15 batteries out of 100 well this one's a fairly straightforward percentage uh, conversion it's 15% because 15 over 100 is equivalent to 15% if the cumulative frequency was say 120 and you found the answer was 15 batteries then you'd have had to have done 15 over 120 times 100 to get your percentage. Okay, but in this case, it was a straightforward out of 100 straight away, so the obvious answer was. Okay, so that's one example of the kind of questions they ask you on cumulative frequency and how you might uh, use the cumulative frequency graph to estimate values and all about the formulas, interquartile range, and so forth.
Okay, so let's look at another question. So this question has given us some information and it's telling us about 40 boys. So the graph has gone to a scale of 40 and it's asking us to find an estimate of the median time. Well, again, the median is about what happens uh, in the middle. Now, I'll give the graph so we estimate that. So out of the 40 boys, the median uh, will be the middle one, so the 20th boy, 40 divided by 2. So we use the graph, we come across, and we read off. And as always, we look very carefully at the scale of the graph. And what we can see on the scale is along the bottom here, every square is worth 1. 10 squares for 10, so 1 square must be 1. So here we've got 30, 31, 32, 33, 33 and a half, if we're reading accurately. So 33.5 seconds. So 33.5. So that's the medium. The question then goes on to talk about uh, what happens for the minimum time, the maximum time. So it's kind of a suggestion you might be drawing a box plot here. And then when we read the actual question, it says use the information in the graph above to plot a box plot. So we're going to need to get some five values because what we need to realize about a box plot is the general shape of them is like that and somewhere along the line we need the minimum value, we need the maximum value, we need the lower quartile value and the upper quartile value and then we need the median value. So those are the five values we need. Well the minimum value they've told us is 9, the maximum value they've told us is uh, 57 that information has been given to us in the question. Uh, the median value we estimated above, so that's 33.5. And all we need is the lower quartile and the upper quartile. Well, the lower quartile value is a quarter of the way through our data. So out of the 40, a quarter, that's 10. So we're going to come across and our quarter way is there. So we come down and we read off that value, which is 16. So that's the lower quartile value. And then we uh, do the same for the upper quartile. We go three to three quarters of the way through. So adding 10 and 20, which was halfway in the quarter way, that'll give us the three quarters. So we come across from 30. And we can see that, that if we read it accurately, when we come down, it's going to be 41, 42, 43, 44, 44 and a half. So that's going to be our upper quartile value. So 44.5. So we've got all those values and we've got to plot a box plot. So well, they've given us a scale to draw on. So there's our scale. We've got our values. So we can plot the um, box plots. So the minimum was 9. Um, the lower quartile was 16. So halfway and then 16. And our median was 33.5. So halfway and then back a bit. Um, not sure I printed in to draw the actual graph paper behind this, but there would have been on your exam question, guys, uh, graph paper here, just like this question here, to draw this much more accurately. But uh, this is just an example of what uh, you've got to do for these kind of questions. So 44 and a half, or halfway, and then back a touch, and then 57, um, halfway, and on a touch. So we get our rulers uh, and so forth, and we draw our points. So we've got to draw our whiskers first, so the whiskers, then we draw the box. Now remember guys, the height of the box isn't critical, uh, it's just got to look like a rectangle when you've drawn it. So it doesn't have to be exactly a centimetre or anything, just make it a comfortable size for the shape of the graph. And then uh, just finish off with dashes at the end for our whiskers. So that's the uh, box plot with the values drawn. And then the question goes on and says, compare these two box plots. So what we've got to realize is um, when we can make comparisons on data, then the word comparison means that we have to compare an average. So it's always the case when you do comparison questions at GCSE level. We compare an average and we compare a measure of spread. Uh, measure of spread, remember, just means uh, things like the range, the interquartile range. It's a measure of how distributed your data is, how far apart it is, and so forth. So for box plots, the average we're going to use, because you only use one of them when you're making comparisons uh, generally. So the average we're going to use is the median in this case. And the measure of spread, well, 
we've calculated the interquartile range uh, before, so we might as well be using the interquartile range again. Again, the interquartile range is possibly the better measure because it ignores any particular extreme values if there are any new data. Because that uh, maximum, for example, might just be one point. Most of the other data might be around here, and that's just stretch it out a bit. So the interquartile range is probably the better comparator. So what we've got then? So the median was 30. Um, we calculated before that the median here was 33.5, and we've got the lower quartile value and the upper quartile value was um, 44 and a half. Take away 16. So for this graph, or box plot, sorry, the interquartile range is the upper quartile minus the lower quartile. And when we take those away from each other, then um, 16 to 20 is 4, so it's going to be 28.5 seconds. And for this graph, we can read off quickly that the lower quartile value was 23, and the upper quartile value was 34. So for this graph, the interquartile range is 34 minus 23, which equals 11 seconds. So to make the comparison then, we're going to say something like, um, again, we should label, so just to make sure we know what we're doing. This was the boys, and this was the girls. So what we're going to say then is the girls typically took less time to complete the puzzles as the median average was lower and the girls times were closer together as the interquartile range was also smaller at 11 seconds compared to the boys 16 yeah sorry 28 and a half seconds okay so again it's it's useful to compare the actual numbers because you've calculated them um, and it's not just a case of saying it was lower you should really interpret what that lower means so the girls typically completed the puzzle um, completed the puzzles quicker because their median average was lower and the girl times were close together because the interquartile range so the box width was smaller showing that their data in the middle half was uh, less spread out Okay, so that's an example of drawing box plots and uh, using them to compare two sets of data. Um, so here we've got to draw another uh, cumulus frequency graph. So it says complete the cumulus frequency graph. So again, it's all about adding up your frequencies as you go down. And so we've got uh, 16 out of 34, uh, so 50. And again, we're looking for key information. Uh, we know this number down here has got to become 100. So we've got 50, then plus 32 makes 82. And then we add on the 14, which makes 96. And then we add on the last four, which makes the 100. So we've got the 100 we were expecting when we were adding the cumulus frequency, because the gave us a clue in the question it should add up to 100. The question then goes on to say, draw the graph. So we've got to draw the cumulus frequency graph. So we've got our um, table of data. And again, as always, we've got to remember to plot the ends of the intervals for group data when we draw the cumulus frequency graph. So we're going to draw 10 against 16 and 20 against 50 and so forth. So let's get that plotted. So we've got 10 against 16. Again, look at the scale of the graph. Each little square here, we've got 10 of them going up to 20. So each little square is worth 2. So we've got 10, 16, and then it's 20 up to 50. And then it's 30 up to 82. And then it's 40 up to 96. So 92, 46. And then it's 50 up to 100. Okay, so these examples have been reasonably straightforward with the numbers because they yeah, stop to 100. But uh, they won't always go to 100. So 
just remember that. And the lowest value that was given in the uh, table of data was zero. So our graph is going to start at zero, zero. So again, it's about using your uh, pencil or pen and not taking it off the paper while you're th drawing through the points with one smooth curve. So what I tend to do is draw it without putting the pen point down so my hand's starting to get the movement and then I'll come through with the pen down and draw the best curve I can through the crosses. Okay, so it's a little bit out there, so I'd have to be really careful. Probably doing pencil is better than going with the pen afterwards. Um, I've actually gone a bit thin there. So on the grid, draw the cube to finish graph. So I've done that. And then it says, uh, use your graph to find an estimate for the number of calls that took more than 18 seconds. So again, we look at the scale of this graph. So every square is going to be ones. So 18 seconds is going to be there. So we get our ruler and we come up from 18. across and read off our answers. Um, so 18 to there, yeah, our estimate then is going to be 44 here. So we've got to remember what that 44 means. Um, it's, this is telling us that uh, 44 calls took less than 18 seconds, so this is less than, but up to the 100 here we've got a gap of 56 calls took longer than 18 seconds. So we look back at the question, so it says use the graph to the calls of it took more than 18 seconds. Well we've done that bit there because the more than 18 seconds is all of these, because all of these are more than 18 seconds and that part of the graph is this bit here. So the answer to this question was 56 calls. So that's that particular question done with some methods shown. I'll just uh, use the lines and draw them on, show you how it's going on, guys. Okay, um, next question. So here we've got a graph, a uh, computer graph given to us. They're telling us about 200 students and they've told us something about the lowest and the highest, and we've got to draw a box plot. So we need those five values again. So we've got that standard picture in our mind of what a box plot looks like. So we need the minimum, the lower quartile, the median the upper quartile and the maximum. So again the minimum they've told us 10, the highest they've told us 60 and the lower quartile well because we're going to a total cumulative frequency of 200 we want 25% of that or a quarter of the way so that's um, 50. Looking at this scale we've got to be careful here each little square is going up in twos, uh, no it's not, we've got 40 in 10 squares so each little square is going to be in fours so when we're doing 50 then we're going to have to be careful, so 40, 44, 48, so 50 is going to be halfway there. So again, read our graph as accurately as we can do. And then when we come down, so again look at the scale along here, we can see that it's going one, uh, one square for each one. So this is going to be 25, 26, 27, 28, 28, 29 and a half. So that value there is going to be 29 and a half, and that's going to be our lower quartile. So we start filling in numbers across here to see what we're doing. And then the uh, three quarters of the way, well, we add the 50 to the halfway, which would have been 100, so that's 150 for our quarter way. So again, scale, four for every square. So 120, halfway between there and there is going to be 140. So 144, 148, 150, halfway again. And then down. So we can see from our scale here, it's going to be 41, 42, 43. So our upper quartile is going to be 43. So we go through that process of plotting those values. So we had a minimum of 10. We had a lower quartile value of 29.5. So again, it's about scale. Each square across here is one. Uh, then we had a, we can do the median. So we do the median across. So the median was 100. So 100 is halfway between there. So the median is going to be there. And of course we come down. So 30, 35, 36, 37 and a half. 
37.5 so for the median. So I plot those values then. So we've got 29.5, uh, then it was 37.5, uh, then it was 43, and then it was 60. So we've got our uh, points plotted. Now we can uh, draw the uh, whiskers. And then draw the box. Again, it's not necessary that the box has to take the whole page, just as long as it's defined. So, rectangular shape. And then the median, once you draw through the point. Okay. And then the uh, whiskers get ended with the little dashes. So that's the uh, box plot drawn.